So, title is toward the geometry of group theoretical particle physics in the QSN. If we're going to try to do everything with inflations on the QSN, then um, it's pretty restrictive and simple. So, um, so how do we how do we imagine group theoretic particle physics with the QSN? So this is just a very beginning preliminary um, thoughts and ideas. Uh, there are a lot of facts in here, and there are some conjectures and creative observations. Uh, so the field idea, of course, is antiquated. Nowadays, it's replaced by quantum field theory, which are fields of particles discreetly appearing and disappearing. And so our approach is to go even further toward discretization than quantum field theory, where we will also discretize the space and the time coordinates where particles can discreetly appear and disappear. Our operations are inflations upon a Planck scale possibility point space of the QSN, where the ultimate reduction is binary on-off actions on the points themselves. Using a section of the Penrose tiling possibility space, we can see how some points are turned on while others are turned off according to code theoretic rules from this possibility space in order to select a given one of the 12 legal inflations upon that finite space. Once these binary selections have been selected from the set of possible selections, edges are then recognized between near neighbors at a given inflation scale. So this is just one of many inflation scales that could have been used. This is the scale phi 2. Each selection of on and off points is an inflation cor which um, corresponds to two things. The thickness of the projection window, which, defi which defines the inflation scale in this golden ratio power series. and the position of the projection window, which is defined by a shift vector action in, for example, the elser sloan quasi-crystal, would define one of a large set of code, the of code legal inflations on some finite points set in the QSN um, or in the possibility space for the elser sloan quasi-crystal itself for that particular inflation. So in other words, you pick an inflation scale for some finite uh, area or volume of your possibility space. And once you've picked that scale, phi 2, phi 10, uh, then there are some quantity of uh, possible um, inflations at that scale, which are defined by your shift vector actions of, of the window itself, where the thickness defines the inflation scale and the uh, translation or rotation defines uh, which of the uh, legal permutations uh, as inflations at that scale. So with a given empire, the syntactical freedom for the non-empire points is defined by the relationship of the projection window to the empire window. So here in yellow, I have the empire window. And in blue, I can alternate the position of my projection window relative to the empire window in discrete increments because the reason they're discrete is because an arbitrarily or an infinitesimal rotation between the certain discrete translations which bring in new sets of points to enter and exit the blue cut window is a finite set. It's a finite set for a finite yep. length to come into, right? Absolutely. If it's infinite, then it's infinite. So this principle defines the 12 legal on-off selections of points on this finite possibility space of the Penrose tiling, the empire window to cut window concept. So there is a symmetry of the empire window to the projection window relationship where the total quantity of points sent to the projection or inflation space is generally conserved and where there is an approximate mirror symmetry between the positions of the points at each click of discrete translation of this window in the allowed directions around the empire 
In other words, if you click up or down, approximately an equal number of points enters and exits the window, so it's conserved. And secondly, um, there's a symmetry between, there's an, there's an approximately conserved symmetry between the different groups of, of points such, such that if you find a set of points down here, um, there's another, there's another, there are other sets above it uh, which you could have chosen to do the same thing. So there's one here where I can get some projection, but there's another one in the mirror side uh, where I can uh, often get a similar or same projection. So, that's, so then the quantity of clicks allowed in the directions is also approximately the same. So if I had five total, I'd have one where I don't translate the cut window, where the center of my projector window and the center of my empire window are coincident. And then, for example, I can have two clicks down and two clicks up from that centered position. So there's a symmetry in this um, space of, of translations in the various directions that are allowed around your, your hyper window. So I will share um, some new ideas on how group theoretic gauge symmetry physics can be explained by the relationship between the QSN and the Elser Sloan quasi crystal, including some ideas on the quantum Higgs field. But first, we should synchronize some ideas, if only for the purpose of understanding my presentation. Gauge symmetry particle physics corresponds to these fundamental symmetry groups and Lie lattices. We have U1, which corresponds to a one sphere, which can be thought of as a hot, as a hot fiber, which is part of the electromagnetic force. SU2, which corresponds to A1, which is a line, which corresponds to the electroweak force and the other part of the electromagnetic force. SU3, which corresponds to A2, which corresponds to the uh, equilateral triangle and to the A2 lattice. And that corresponds to the strong nuclear force. SU4, which corresponds to the A3 lattice, which is equal to the D3 group, which corresponds to the ordinary FCC packing as the minimal energy of most um, atomic configurations at zero Kelvin. And that has been used in larger groups to try to link gravity to the standard model. And then SU5, which corresponds to A4, the four-dimensional um, simplex lattice, um, which corresponds to the unification of the other three forces um, of the standard model, so not gravity. Note that a couple of minutes ago I said inflation code physics on the QSN can be generated by empire and projection window relationships on the Elser Sloan quasi crystal instead of the E8 lattice. So it's something for us to consider. Either we generate our dynamics, our inflation patterns, on the QSN by moving cut windows in the E8 lattice, which generate phason dynamics in the Elser Sloan, which can generate change or dynamics or inflation sequences in the QSN. Or you can leave E8 out since Elser Sloan encodes the necessary information from E8 anyway, and you work your dynamics, your algebra, and your geometry from the relationship between the Elser Sloan quasi crystal and the QSN. So I'm not sure about what we should do, but we should be discussing both, uh, both ways. Uh, so for now, though, since we haven't discussed as much the idea of generating our dynamics between Elser Sloan and QSN without worrying about shift vectors in E8, I'm going to be defending the idea of using the Elser Sloan to QSN solely to generate our dynamics. Um, abstractly speaking, let us envision that a regular or semi-regular polytope has an N-sphere around it, 
For example, we can picture something like the E8 lattice, and we can imagine seven spheres around every one of the root vector polytopes in the E8 lattice. We can just imagine that it's naturally implied there as the circumscribing uh, sphere around these polytopes. So hot vibration is the decomposition of a three sphere into an infinite set of circles, one spheres, called, hot, called a hop bundle. And this can be generalized to other dimensions. We may cast out an infinity of circles from the bundle by selecting only the circles that are coincident with sets of vector endpoints or vertices on great circles of the three sphere. So in this case, vertices on some particular polytope, like the 600 class. Exactly. So the Elser Sloan quasi crystal can be generated with an overlapping packing of 600 cells, where there are seven depths of overlap of the 600 cells and one kiss, one way that they kiss. So if you choose to imagine one of the code theoretic letter sets in the Elser Sloan quasi crystal as 600 cell relationships, then these eight relationships or letters can be used where there are both strict rules and syntactical freedom for the arrangements of the eight letters. And for some finite section of the Elser Sloan QC possibility point space, there are n language expressions allowed where n is finite and where n is equal to the number of allowed projection window translations relative to the empire window. So back to hop fibers. Let us discretize the hop fiber bundle around each 600 cell in the Elser Sloan quasi crystal by casting out all of the fibers that do not intersect vertices of the inscribed 600 cells in the three spheres where our fibers must be great circles. This generates 12 hop fibers or circles around each 600 cell. So I'm describing a phrase that I'll use throughout the presentation called a double discretization or a two-step discretization or a twice discretized process. So let us next discretize each of these 12 hop fibers around each 600 cell. So just as an n sphere can be decomposed into an infinite set of one spheres, a circle is an infinite set of zero simplices. Following the same focus on vertices, we cast out the infinity of points other than those coincident with the 600 cell vertices on the 12 hop fibers. So of course, this generates 12 regular decagons or 12 pairs of pentagons rotated from one another by arc cosine phi over two. In n-gon number theory, the 5-gon is prime and the 10-gon is not. So the irreducible n-gon decomposition of the twice discretized set of hot fibers on each 600 cell of the Elser Sloan quasi-crystal is a symmetric four-dimensional network of 24 pentagons. Hopefully that's clear. If you then cast out all the edges of the Elser Sloan quasi crystal and only draw the edges of the Pentagon hop fiber network, it will be a different looking quasi crystal, but will have the same H4 symmetry and will include connections that link all the 600 cell vertices into a network. You can decompose the Penrose tiling into a network of pentagons as well. So maybe planes containing pentagons in this version of the Elser Sloan quasi crystal are subsets of the Penrose tiling. Or maybe the Penrose tiling is a subset of these planes. But both certainly have H2 symmetry. Of course, we construct the compound quasi crystal from the Elser Sloan quasi crystal. And planes in the compound quasi crystal contain the Penrose tiling as a subset. The purpose of all this so far is to point out that the mathematical tools from hot fiber physics can be applied here at QGR with a transformation matrix 
between the pre and post projected higher dimensional twice discretized fibers. In other words, imagine the Elser Sloan quasi crystal as this twice discretized hot fiber network that I described. And now imagine any pattern that you have in the dynamic QSN as a transformation that can be mapped where the physics using quaternions and hot fiber formalism in four dimensions is translated through some um, transformation matrix between the, this network of hot fibers twice discretized in 4D and your network of fibers, if you want, transformed fibers in the dynamic sequence of um, compound quasi-crystal selections, where each one of those selections is essentially an inflation of the QSN. So this transformation-based discrete hot fiber theory may be more powerful, or may be powerful at least, if we can understand the mathematical mapping to unification physics. Um, Approach, 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 approach using torus topology. So I'm going to explain why. So what can we say about the geometry of the transformation of each of these networks of 24 twice discretized hop fibers, these pentagons? Can I ask you a question for some clarification? When you're talking about the transformations, and a couple of slides back, you said between the pre and post projected. Yeah. That's the transformation. So the post, so when you do a hop vibration, there's a certain, it creates a certain mapping to a sphere in two dimensions, but then, but that's not the same as an orthogonal projection to two dimensions. So are you talking about an orthogonal projection, or are you talking about more like the hop mapping that ends up in? I'm talking about either. So if you do an orthogonal projection, there should be some way to recover, right, the link, the linkage, the mapping between the pre and pro post transformed structures. And then similarly, there should be topological ways if you don't use um, orthogonal projection. So what can we say about the geometry of the transformation of each of these networks of 24 twice discretized hot fiber pentagons? I suggest that it has something in common with the projection of a discretized set of hot fibers from R4 to R3. And what can we say about that? This is discretized because obviously you see that this is not a three sphere projected to R3. This is, this is with an infinity of hot fibers from the three sphere cast out so that you can see things better or in a different way. But what can we say about this transformation of this discrete set of hot fibers? Well, two obvious things. First, there is a complex inner and outer structure that emerges in the projection that does not exist in the pre-projected object. The second is that there is a natural helicity that may not exist other than topologically in the pre-transformed network of 24 pentagon hop fibers on the 600 cells. And of course, we have torus geometry in case that is helpful for us, for our physics, which I think it is. And I will relate this to the discretized Higgs field later. But first, I would like to play with an interesting perspective that I have about gauge groups and the notion of inflation. It is obvious to see how you can get all of your gauge groups in, for example, the E8 lattice. In E8, we have SU3, SU2, and all the other necessary groups in the lattice stack ranging from A1 to A8, where A8 composites to the E8 lattice as the union of three copies of A8. But you need to break the symmetry to create different particles in the Higgs field at different space-time coordinates, such that at one coordinate, we have an electron, and at another coordinate, we have, for example, a photon. Garrett Lisi does this by abstractly imagining that, in his words, E8 goes wobbly. So it's the wobbliness in his mind of E8 
where he imagines uh, the symmetry being broken. Imagine this like the 8D lattice is a big bowl of eight-dimensional jello with different vibrations interacting and describing the fundamental particles and their transformations over time and interactions. However, this, is, uh, this, this ad hoc idea of a fundamental Lee lattice, and by the way, uh, Garrett didn't necessarily mean that that was anything other than a, uh, a creative um, metaphor. Okay, so I don't want to claim that Garrett was using the vibration in a formal way because I'm not as familiar enough with his work to say that either way. But the idea of these vibrations can be uh, an ad hoc idea of this, of this fundamental Lee lattice vibrating such that it might, not, it might not work or it might not be in some sense what nature is actually doing. You know, is nature actually vibrating the E8 lattice or is it something else? Now, it hasn't yet fully worked for Garrett, and he's, and he's humble about that. He doesn't claim that his theory is a successful unification theory, and he has things in the model that he's still working on, and he has some amazing things that inspire me about his approach. Now, of course, we're going to use projective geometry to break symmetry. But what about the Higgs boson? Hasn't that particle been discovered, and isn't that responsible for symmetry breaking? Well, yes, it is, but one must be clear on what, what you mean by the word particle. When we say this particle has been discovered, what do we mean by particle? The particle defines the symmetry breaking mechanism and is very abstract, like all particles in quantum field theory. It is indeed a geometric object, so it's sort of like a particle or local object. In other words, the Higgs field is made of these objects that are local, that we call a particle, Higgs boson. But it's not like we have observed this particle in the same way that we can fire a neutron at a screen and decide it's real, or that we've uh, measured it by looking at an electromagnetic interaction between the neutron and some mass or some charge on the screen. It is a particle in the sense that at every coordinate in space, the quantum field can express different particles, and over time, two particles can interact and transform. In space-time, discretized quantum field theory, so that is quantum field theory where the fields have been discretized into particles, and then you go a step further and you discretize um, the space-time in which the particles can exist, uh, we would say, then, that the Higgs transformers only exist at discrete coordinates in space-time, such that a particle cannot exist at all uh, at certain places in space and time. That's what discretization of space-time can mean. The, uh, the string-theoretic analog of this idea is the Calabi-Yau manifold, where at the Planck scale, particles can only exist at certain coordinates in this manifold. But where at a given coordinate where there is a Calabi-Yau object, then any of the fundamental particles can exist at that coordinate as different transformations um, of the Calabi-Yau uh, object. So, here we encounter a familiar mathematical fact. You can only arrange things, such as strings, Higgs actions, people, atoms, in combinations of these ways, periodic or disorderly or orderly, but not periodic. So you can arrange them in combinations of any, any two, three, or one of these fundamental ways. And orderly and non-periodic allows for code-theoretic physics. Loop quantum gravity theorists hope someday to describe particle physics with their disorderly spin foam. I'm going to structure my connection to the Higgs mechanism using words and images from a talk that Garrett Lisi gave. 
for every point in space-time, there is another space with more dimensions that are perpendicular to our own 3D space. So it's not in our space, it's attached to our space. So from now on, uh, I'm going to quote Garrett, and when it's not in quotation marks, it's me commenting on his quotes. For each allowed direction in this abstract space, there is a different type of corresponding elementary particle that can exist at a given 3 plus 1 uh, uh, physical space coordinate. Scientists don't know yet what the shape of this perpendicular space is. But we know that part of it is the four-dimensional Higgs field. So picture this ball to be some unknown, perfectly symmetric, four-dimensional shape at, the Planck's, at a Planck scale coordinate in some 4D abstract space different than our 3 plus 1 space. So note that the 600 cell fits this description, a symmetric 4D shape. Via symmetry breaking, you have to pick one direction as special to generate a given fundamental particle. This is also what you are doing with the 600 cell when you make the hope vibration. Mm -hmm. You select a direction because otherwise there is many possible uh, yeah. hope vibration. Mm -hmm. um, so different directions of this symmetric four-dimensional shape. If it's symmetric, it's like a fundamental polytope. Um, and uh, so picking directions is similar to picking projection vectors. So this is called the Higgs direction, and the system is called the Higgs background. Picture this Higgs field rippling. It's this abstract Higgs field. It's not like exactly physical. It's, this, it's in this abstract perpendicular space. And picture it rippling, says Garrett. And picture a field in our 3 plus 1 space with ripples in the direction of this abstract Higgs field, where the ripples are particles. So you may notice that when you think about a physical space and this abstract four-dimensional space, and you think of directions, it's very similar to the idea that if we here are in a sequence of projections um, from some higher dimensional Elser Sloan space, uh, then for each, you zoom down all the way to the Planck scale, and you can imagine that where there exists some fundamental particle, there is some relationship to some special to some fundamental objects in the Elser Sloan quasi crystal relative to the projective space, so that different relationships. Of the, of the local areas of the projection space, different angular relationships or direction relationships to objects in the higher dimensional space will create different fundamental objects down here. So it sounds similar in form in some way, um, if we are to be you know, creative here. So picture how this unknown 4D shape twists around in this abstract space to generate an elementary particle. And by twist, he literally means twist. We're speaking of things that involve the rotation. Next, Garrett tries to explain the geometry of how these twisting actions occur. There is another shape, he says, that relates to the first four-dimensional shape, and that other shape is a torus. One direction on the torus corresponds to weak charge, while another direction corresponds to hypercharge. The Planck scale 4D shape twists around a toroidal path along the four-dimensional Higgs field direction. So you imagine this shape, that he doesn't know what it is, that it's twisting or rotating around this toroidal shape. This corresponds to different charges of that particular Higgs direction. You count the number of twists around the torus, and, the, and there are three twists around the hypercharge direction, 
and there is one twist around the weak charge direction. So the twist paths of this object, this shape on this torus, cannot just take any arbitrary path. They have to take paths that result in three windings or one. So this is how the symmetry is broken with the electroweak force. Perpendicular to the Higgs direction, we have the electric charge and the weak mixing angle, which gives part of the hypercharge and weak charge. Weak mix angle is the Weinberg angle. Ah, yes. And so the Weinberg angle, so the mixing angle being the Weinberg angle that we conjectured in our chapter 8 of that Minkowski Institute book where we suggest that if the Kibibo angle is the value that we represented, which is a golden ratio expression, then therefore the Weinberg angle uh, would be this other golden ratio value related to that. And those golden ratio analytical expressions, um, at least the Kabibo angle versions, were reported by five other authors in several peer review papers. Um, they fit squarely within the bounds of increasingly high resolution um, particle collider data. All other elementary particles that can exist also twist in small in a small set of possible twist paths along this electroweak torus so that all the particles must operate relative to this, electro, this fundamental electroweak torus. And we can plot them according to their twist. The Higgs relationship and simple torus paths explain all the fundamental particles. The top and bottom quark have the same number of twists as the up and down quarks. So there, is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of overlaps, as Garrett says. But that his point was that since the top and bottom quark have the same number of twists um, as the up and down quark, he's arguing that every uh, fundamental particle can be described with, with, these, uh, with these very simple twist uh, winding numbers on this, on this object. The Higgs directions are a small set of directions. They relate to the unknown shape with some unknown angle. Here, Garrett shows the right to left arrows acting to manifest into physical uh, space uh, certain particles. So that's these arrows going from right to left. He says that, for example, at every point in our physical space, when we have an electron, it is bouncing back and forth between its right and left-handed parts relative to this Higgs background, which gives it reality. That is, gives it mass and identifies it as an electron as opposed to, for example, a photon. So this is how all the ele elementary particles come about. There is another torus corresponding to the strong force that quarks twist around in a triangular pattern and that also gluons, which twist around it to charge the color force um, or vertex color of the triangles of the quarks. So everything in the universe comes from this beautiful twisting geometry. So guys, there is a deep and serious assumption built into modern gauge symmetry physics. It is the choice of interpretation of what the meaning is of experimental evidence showing that no matter how fast you move, your clocks will always measure a photon moving at the speed of light. If your physical ontology assumes point particles, which cannot have internal clocks, and you assume structureless vacuum space, then particles cannot move or experience time in an absolute sense other than relative to other clocks and propagators. We will have a formalism using a massive particle internal clock and those clocks will be able to propagate relative to a space-time that has substructure. So the rationale for, for relativity begins with these two with these three things, the assumption that particles have no internal substructure, the assumption uh, 
that because they're point particles and that space-time is pure nothingness, vacuum space with no substructure. And so that with those two assumptions in hand, it's incredibly deductive and reasonable to understand that you cannot claim, you cannot even say logically that a particle or a clock moves in time or in space relative to anything other than other clocks and other propagators in that space. However, if you have a discretized background, some substructure of space, then a particle can propagate relative to that substructure. And if you discretize time as ordered sets of state selections on some geometric space, like a moduli space form of a, of a, of a graph theoretic theory like ours, then over some set of state selections, 10 state selections that can give you your animation, you have an absolute number, 10. And for that absolute number, you can animate your clock and your propagation steps with various ratios that are absolute, that are real. Now, you'll never be able to measure that, right? Because how would you know as a particle what, what how do we know what our particles ratios for, for these 10 frames or, or graph states, how do we know what our ratio of clock time is relative to propagation? We don't. So our measurements would always be relativistic. Um, and you're all familiar with the simple understanding that you must, in this formalism, always measure a photon moving at the same rate because if you chase it at 99% the speed of light, your clocks have almost stopped. And so what you measure with very slow clocks will appear to be moving uh, away from you very quickly. And, and, the round, and there's a round trip requirement for these measurements. The spaceship has to emit a photon, then that must go to some object like a mirror. It's a thought experiment, but it has to bounce back come to your detector and interface with your clocks to give you your measurement, but your clocks at that point have almost stopped. So we just have to be careful. Um, we, we have a lot more discussion to do about whether or not this um, simpler Occam's razor view with, with, with this graph theoretic frame by frame approach, whether or not it will work. I know not everyone, every one of us is not convinced of this, so we need a lot more discussion on it. But the reason I'm bringing it up in the context of this presentation is because I just want to encourage us to, to just always be aware that as we're borrowing formalisms from other parts of physics and mathematics, um, we may not need to assume the abstract substance of time <clears throat> that is the canonical view currently. Um, we may be able to assume, in other words, changing patterns in a graph in three space, in R3. And if we can do that, we should try. So we just have to be careful and critical and not accidentally fall into the assumptions that would otherwise require 4D manifolds as a way to explain how each particle experiences time differently. We must be careful about what we think time is in the first place. I don't think we should allow ourselves to fall into the trap of time as an abstract substance in the way that others presume. We must stay purely mathematical and recognize ordered sets of changing inflation states on our graph point space to animate the different internal clock rates. That's what we want to try to do unless we find out it can't work. With that said, we can conjecture uh, what might be the mysterious shape that Garrett is speaking of if we suppose nature uses the Elser Sloan quasi-crystal and the QSN? And what defines the simple and restricted twist numbers? Right? What's the first principles in this e, in this Elser Sloan quasi-crystal and these rings on 600 cells that would explain why we have these really simple twist numbers that Garrett is talking about? And why is it a torus form in the first place? And why are there two tori, not one or more? Perhaps the shape is the 20 group. We know by now that we can induce higher dimensional Lie algebras from this shape. Can you go back? Uh, 
tutorial. Um, tutorial. Well, uh, uh, further back. So, so you know that thirty tetrahedron ring, right? When you project it to three to three D, it's made of three diagons, but in three D looks like a torus, right? And it twisted it, I would say, three times when it and it comes back. So, so if you look at the El Sloan quasi crystal, each of the vertex there is a center of a six hundred cell. So you can kind of think six hundred cell actually is moving, you know, like a torus, like right. along the torus of service, right. and you can have three of them right. that follow that ring. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. That's, to that's a very good point. Yeah. All right, so we've done a paper, and there's other papers done on how you can induce the higher dimensional groups lattices and associated Lie algebras from lower dimensional things. And so we did that with the 20 groups. So we can, we can recognize that in this, this complicated shape in R3, this 20 group, which has this deep relationship to the projection of E8 to Elser Sloan and then the slicing of Elser Sloan and compounding process. So we know that it, we know from other works, we know where it comes from. It comes from E8 ultimately in Elser Sloan. And we also know that others have done work, including us, on inducing higher dimensional information from the 20 group. Uh, well, others have done it with the icosahedron. We did it specifically with the 20 group. Um, so the 20 group contains five copies of, so we're going to decompose the 20 group right now because it's the, the 20 group is this sort of representation of the QSN that you can understand a lot of the group theoretic uh, physics that are available to you in the QSN by understanding the 20 group itself. So the 20 group is a compound of five copies of the root vector polytope of A3, which is equal to D3, by the way, which corresponds to SU4. Uh, admitting, it admits SU3 and SU2 as subgroups and subpolytopes. We'll, we'll explain more. For example, we can decompose the symmetry of the five copies of A3 that are in the 20 group. So the 20 group, the root vector polytope of A3 is the cube octahedron. And the 20 group uh, is five cube octahedra rotated about a center in an even way uh, that is uh, called the jitterbug angle. If you rotate it from one axis or the cut parts from one axis, and then you'd recognize it as our 15.522 degree angle. So we call <clears throat> we call the we call the um, we call the jitterbug angle J, and we call the um, the angle that you're more familiar with, P, which is, you know, three three phi minus one over four, and the arc uh, arc cosine of that. So that's P. But what's uh, what's kind of cool is that the um, that these two guys generate one another. So that if you take two tetrahedra and you kiss them face to face and you rotate them. Uh, or you, or you take them in, a 20, in an evenly distributed 20 group, for example, with gaps. If you rotate by the jitterbug angle, which is a golden ratio angle, on the outside through outer face centers, through the shared vertex at the center, you rotate them by J all in one direction or the other, and then you'll generate the 20 group. But you'll also generate P, the P angle, 15.522 degrees, on the inner face relationships. So, and if you take the interface relationships, you can generate J by, by rotating the interface uh, on the vertex that's the shared at the center of the 20 group uh, by P. So P generates A, and they're both irrational. And then 2 times J plus P equals this very important angle, 60 degrees. And it's important because. In some sense, you can think about it as an iterative generating angle of all of the fundamental A, E, D lattices in any dimension 
that's really trivial, but you can take a one simplex, rotate, it, rotate a copy of it on an edge by arc, arc cosine one half, and you uh, generate the convex hull of a two simplex, and you can rotate that by 60 degrees on some angle 60 degrees that makes, it that makes its vertex equidistant from the other three. And now you've generated the um, three simplex, and you can keep repeating that process. And at 4D, at the level of the four simplex, there's a special case where you can decompose, where you have a dihedral angle, okay, which equals arc, arc, arc cosine one quarter. And arc cosine one quarter is an important dihedral angle in this series because arc cosine can be, one quarter can be de decomposed as this arc cosine one half plus arc cosine three phi minus one over four. And, and that's perhaps important because when we take this value arc cosine one quarter that has this generating angle 60 degrees taken out so that you can sort of separate or decompose this, this simpler arc cosine one quarter expression into this more complicated irrational component and this kind of fundamental rational component as 60 degrees, um, then that, this component here in 3D is how, is how you can arrange, uh, that's how you can arrange this one and only angle that can collapse the tetrahedral configurations into only 10 plane classes um, that causes the faces to kiss, that makes it a quasi-crystal because any deviation from this angle here will result in arbitrary closeness in your infinite compound quasi-crystal, thereby rendering it a, a not a quasi-crystal because it won't have discrete Bragg peaks in its Fourier transform. So anyway, so this is like a really deep fundamental limit or special thing, this angle. And so, to me, the power of our physics, if it is to be powerful in the future, is that we have the best of both worlds. We have all the group symmetry physics that come from A2, right, A3, A4, even A4 because of the construction of, with this angle. So we've got A1, A2, A3, A4 uh, based physics all built into the QSN, which we wouldn't have if we just projected E8 to 3D, to R3. We would destroy that, those, those beautiful sets of crystallographic gauge symmetry physics that are encoded in the 20 group. So we have all of that preserved by the compounding approach, plus we have more symbolic power because of the arbitrary choice of right-left, it introduces a, a, a second sign value in your symbolism, chirality sign value, um, and it's got other. It's got other. And then you have whatever whatever physics others have done with icosions and H three symmetry. Uh, that too is available to you in the QSN. So you get a lot a lot of bonuses mathematically. Um, by doing it the way we're doing it, instead, so it's kind of like we get crystallographic math and non-crystallographic, quasi-crystallographic in one object. We just have to figure out, it's a fact that those are bonuses, so that's more, more rich, but, but it's not a fact that we've figured out how to exploit those bonuses for realistic physics, right? That's our challenge now. So we can decompose the symmetry of these five copies of A3 that are in the 20 group and all over the QSN Thusly, we have A3, we, we have one A3, which is A3-1, which can correspond to SU4, which can relate to conformal gravity. We have another copy that contains SU3, uh, which, can, which relates to a ternary symmetry of the three families, the three generations. We have a, another A3 that contains SU3, which can relate to chromodynamics, which is the strong force. We have another copy that contains SU2, which relates to the electroweak force, and then a fifth copy, which contains U1, uh, the U1 portion of Maxwell's field. 
parts of this slide uh, are from Ray's ideas, so thank you for that, Ray. All right, but what is uh, A31 equals SU4? So Jim Wheeler explains it, and everybody has access to this on the shared drive, but Jim Wheeler explains uh, its link to the standard model in this reference here, for those who want to get into this. And then Carlos Castro explains its link, uh, link, link to E8 and Clifford algebra CL16 um, and to conformal uh, gravity, the conformal gravity action uh, based um, in, by gauging the conformal group um, SO, SO4 to uh, SU22 in 4D. And there's the reference for that. I'll just read a, a section. Uh, Ray recommended I put this in. So Carlos wrote, not long ago, a Chern-Simmons E8 gauge theory of gravity based on optic E8 invariant constructed in this work was advanced as a unified field theory of uh, Langsos, Lovelock uh, gravitational theory and an E8 generalized Yang-Mills field theory. It was defined in the 15-dimensional boundary of a 16-dimensional bulk space. The exceptional E8 geometry of the Clifford algebra CL16, superspace grand unified Unific uh, grand unification of conformal gravity and Yang-Mills was studied more recently, and in particular, it was discussed how an E8 Yang-Mills in 8D, after a sequence of symmetry breaking processes of E8 to E7 to E6 to SO8 and 2, leads to a conformal gravitational theory in 8D based on the conformal group SO8 and 2 in eight dimensions. Upon performing a kaluza klein that Vaticus uh, compactification on CP2, which I'll be mentioning CP2 a little bit later, <coughs> involving a non-trivial torsion, leads to a conformal gravity Yang-Mills unified theory based on the standard model gauge group SU3 times SU2 times U1 in four dimensions. So perhaps we don't need the 65,536 dimensions of CL16, and not even the 16-dimensional bulk, but only the E8 lattice and its quasi-crystalline compactification, the Elser-Sloan quasi-crystal, and a Planck scale 3D representation, which is the QSN. Surprisingly, a similar E8 to E7 to E6 to SO8 and 2 symmetry breaking process is presented as the effect of the viewing vector induced from the QSN to E8 and using integral Jordan matrices and the construction of E8 as the union of three copies of A8. And we recently filmed some discussions where we finally figured this A8 thing out while Marnie and uh, Marcelo and Ray were with Tony. The 20 group also encodes information about A4 which has been used to unify the three non-gravitational forces. A4 information exists in it because the H3 symmetric relationship between the five A3 root vector polytopes that composite into 20 groups are related the way that uh, same root vector polytope, the cube octahedron, relates to other copies of itself in the A4 and D4 sublattices of E8. In other words, you can go to E8 and you can just arbitrarily select a um, cube octahedron in E8. And then you can ask, well, how does this relate to other cube octahedra? And it will relate based on these fundamental relationships of how tetrahedra, which composite into cube octahedra, have angular relationships between them in four-dimensional subspaces of E8, such as D6 or uh, A3. And that's why I think we should use Clifford algebra, possibly, because Clifford algebra already has developed formalisms to analyze, re relate, you know, to deal with volumes. So where you have three vectors sharing the same vertex or origin in a Clifford algebraic formalism, 
then there's work that kind of recognizes how those three can describe a volume, have a convex hull. And what I want to do is, is study the volumetric relationships in the four-dimensional sublattices of E8 and then understand their algebraic um, analogs. So that is, if you have one four-dimensional volume and a second four-dimensional volume and you want to understand something about their angular relationship to one another in R8 and R4, then, <clears throat> then you can perhaps treat those angular relationships, which are irrational, maybe with the Clifford algebraic formalism. So I'm, I know a lot of people here, like Richard and others of you, are, are interested in Clifford algebra. So it also contains U1, which are like hop fibers, if you buy into my twice discretized formalism that I mentioned earlier. It contains the U1 hop fibers if you imagine circumspheres around uh, all of the fundamental polytopes in these sublattices that I'm speaking of. You can just say, all right, every time there's an A3 lattice, I'm going to imagine a natural circumsphere uh, around each polytope, such as the cube octahedron, or maybe I want to imagine my circumspheres around just the tetrahedra. But when we get down to the two-dimensional subspaces, we already have a discrete set of, of hot fibers, right? Because if you take the A2 planes within the E8 lattice, then you imagine only one hot fiber around each equilateral triangle. And then the second form of the discretization is then to, to cast out an infinity of points on the one sphere, the U1 one sphere, and you can convert that to only the points coincident with the vertices of the circumscribing polytope. And at that point, you're just back to, to, a, to a polygon, right? At that point, you just, oh, you just have a polygon. And then you ask, well, can I use these polygons with any of the machinery of hot fiber physics, right? So when you think about polygons as twice discretized hot fibers, so we asked, and we asked the question, OK, well, what defines the simple and restricted twist number options that Garrett was talking about? Now, understand Garrett's idea of dynamically cycling simple twist paths on a torus to be similar to my idea of a Hamiltonian circuit of a 20 group in the QSN that is approximating spherical rotation while, at the same time, helically propagating. Which, by the way, that pattern, as I see it constantly in my imagination, is a toroidal type of form. That if you have something helically propagating while spherically going through a Hamiltonian circuit, it forms a complex geometry that has inner and outer structure that seems, in my imagination, like a toroidal topology. The helical rotation corresponds to the hot fibers of U1 and the chiral path of an electron or positron. U1, of course, is part of the electromagnetic force, is one of the components of the electromagnetic force. So we have, so we already have this notion of the spiral path and this prop and this extrusion of the this extrusion of the u1 so you 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 have your particle moving in u1 but then it's also moving along this perpendicular um, vector which together gives you this um, two parts of the of the electromagnetic um, structure so the second component of the electromagnetic force is su2 which corresponds to the line just a direction. So the two, the two forms, the U1 component and the SU2 component as a straight vector, a line, combine to form helical propagation of charges. So, so why, why does SU2 correspond to a line? 
Um, it's A1. Circle. So, A1. S. It's a root so vector polytope. Sorry, one at a time. I don't know. Okay. You, can, you can take it. Yes, it's, it's the root vector polytope uh, of uh, A1 with uh, one root and the other root which is opposed. So okay. you have only two roots which are opposed, so it's a line. Okay. And the, there is three, three generators, so the two roots and uh, the one-dimensional uh, carton generator. Okay. Yeah, the key is splitting the carton. Uh -huh. So you have the correct time variance is for us, which is just one. So you store the agent value of this object. You can plot it in a line. Yeah. Right yeah. Eigen value. Yeah. Okay. Because it's A1. Yeah. Okay. Um, so anyway, so it's, so we have these two components. If you buy into my hot fiber story, we have these two components. You, uh, you know, this U1 component and this SU2 component to work with in the QSN if we, if we want to. So, but okay, but why, why simple winding numbers? What's, what's the generation of these simple winding numbers? I think it has something to do with what Fong suggested, first of all. Now the simplicity is defined by the logical pathways that a projector would send trit selections from the Elser Sloan quasi-crystal to the projective space of the QSN as legal inflation states at some power of the golden ratio. Uh, just one more information is on the physical point of view, you can look at angular momentum theory. So the eigen values are half inter. Yeah. So you can plot the line. So that right. is relationship directly with A1. Yeah, okay. Um, so the fundamental path of 20 groups are in the Elser Sloan are on tetrahelices in the Elser Sloan quasi crystal. It's pretty much the only way they can move unless you just want to arbitrarily make them, you know, appear here and then appear any other coordinate in Elser Sloan. But if you want to make them move in an obvious way, the, because the entire Elser Sloan quasi crystal can be constructed with only 600 cells that intersect or overlap in seven ways and kiss in one way. And because every one of the 600 cells is just 600 tetrahedra related face to face to face to face, right? This is the adjacent way. Like if you don't jump, if you just move continuously. Yes. Uh, yeah, that, exactly. That's, that's, uh, that's the point. So if you want to just have them jump one tetrahedron to the next, to the next, to the next, to contiguously, then um, the whole thing is a construct, Elser Sloan, of these twisty tetrahelices. So it's very twisty in there. And these paths are drawn on one single 600 cells, which I'm speculating are the mysterious four-dimensional symmetric shape that Garrett wonders about. And two are natural flow pathways on tetrahelices from one 600 cell to other 600 cells that relate in eight ways. There is one very special path on a 600 cell that a 20 group can take. It is a tetrahelix path approximation of a Seifert path on a three sphere, which is represented in the QSN as a trefoil knot. So a Seifert path is basically a line that you can draw on a three-sphere. Now, it can't be a knot because you can't have knots in four dimensions. But you draw this path on the surface of this three-sphere, and then you project that path, the Seifert path, to R3, and you get perhaps the most fundamental knot in knot theory, the trefoil knot. At a deep level, a trefoil knot can be understood as encoding this path on a three-sphere, and our Hamiltonian circuit of a 20 group in the QSN in the form of a trefoil knot can be seen as a sequence of projective transformations from R4 to R3 from paths of 20 groups traveling on tetrahelices approximating a Seifert knot on a 600 cell. That's probably confusing. 
I told you that you can draw this line on a three-sphere that projects to a trefoil knot. Now imagine that three-sphere circumscribing a 600 cell, and then try to approximate a path of the Seifert knot with tetrahelices. So instead of the ordinary tetrahelic ring that we've shown you, where we've taken a great circle of tetrahedra on a 600 cell, and we find that there's a closed ring of 30 that has both 3 and 5 periodicity. Instead of that, then instead, make a, make a path of, of a tetrahelical path that's closed, that most closely approximates the line that you've drawn on the circumscribing three-sphere around it. And that's what I mean. So you project that, that path, that Seifert path of tetrahe tetrahedra on the 600 cell, and you will project it to a tetrahelical knot in R3. Now, what will happen is not all of it will show up in R3. So when you project it, you'll probably capture some of the tetrahedra in this Seifert path in one frame, but not all of them. But if you continue moving through the object, like imagine one of Dugan's 4D to 3D projections and he moves his window or rotates it, and he's moving it. So as you, as you move your projector through the 600 cell where it has this Seifert knot of tetrahedra or the Seifert path of tetrahedra that's trying to become a trefoil in 3D, you understand that in that picture it can't complete it must be 3 plus 1, in other words. To complete the full projection, you have to push your, your projector all the way through the, the three-sphere circumscribing the 600 cell. So it's not going to all necessarily lay down in R3 in one step. So we asked, all right, OK, but why the torus form? Like, how would Garrett's story about the torus form, and I mean, of course, it's other, it's not Garrett's story, it's how Garrett explained it, but why the torus form, how do we relate that to the E8, to Fort, to Elser Sloan, to QSN? Well, of course, a trefoil is a torus form, and this is a trefoil torus. The group of rotations of an irrational projector about a fixed point in the Elser Sloan quasi crystal is SO4. A Clifford torus is the simplest and most symmetric Euclidean space in bedding of the Cartesian product of two circles. And it has to live in R4. And if we want to emphasize complex numbers in our physics, we can recognize that the Clifford torus lives in the complex coordinate space C2 which Carlos mentioned, which is topologically equivalent to R4. And here is the four-dimensional Clifford torus projected to 3D. The double rotation is a helical path on that torus. For a rotation whose two rotation angles form a rational number, the paths will eventually reconnect, and it'll be closed. But if it is irrational, they will not close. If the rotation is isoclinic, slices through the torus, will form Villacau circles as vesica pisces. And we can recognize hot fibers forming circumspheres naturally implied to exist around regular cell cells of lattices, as I imagined. So if you imagine a hot fiber, or just a circle, naturally implied around each of the fundamental building blocks of the A2 lattice, well, then, of course, you do get the vesica Pisces. But what's interesting to me about the vesica Pisces as it relates to the A2 lattice is the golden ratio. And I think you guys all know how that appears. So the special case are the two-dimensional sublattices of a fundamental lattice, such as A3 or A4. Because in the two-dimensional case, like I said earlier, you don't have to discretize hop fibers by casting out an infinity that are not coincident with the vertices. 
In this case, there is only one already around the fundamental building blocks. And in the case of the A2 lattice, this network of hot fibers forms a network of Villacau circles equal to Vesica Pisces, where the golden ratio appears as the relationship of the hot fibers to the two simplexes themselves. So you, I think you're all familiar with that, how, how the golden ratio emerges here. But why two tori? One for three quarks and then another torus for the electromagnetic force. Well, perhaps electrons and positrons are different helicity Seifert paths relative to those to these tetrahelices. And maybe a nucleon is three of these paths intermeshed and sharing objects in their intermeshing, similar to how 420 groups intermeshed in the Elser Sloan quasicrystal share 80 minus 57 equals 23 tetrahedra. When one of these systems decays, a nucleon, then an electron or positron pops out. And a proton has the same charge as a positron. So we see, the, we see a strange relationship, or we see a relationship. It's a matter of opinion on whether it's interesting or not. But we see this relationship between electrons and nucleons, both in terms of charge and in terms of the physical observation of, of a positron from a decaying um, nucleon. And there's lots of models that explain that. So I, I hold back on the word strange. So Wheeler thought that maybe all particles were made of the electron. Stephen Wolfram thinks all fundamental particles are emergent or secondary from some fundamental elements of a trivalent graph at the Planck scale. Indeed, the QSN is perhaps the optimal trivalent graph, a proof that I want to define and then demonstrate not me, I won't personally do it, but I'll help define it. So what about neutrinos? I can hear Cinziana asking. I don't want to over-speculate right now about neutrinos because I just want you all to carefully think about this idea in general at the most simple and preliminary level. And so I don't have a speculation right now about neutrinos. It's hard enough to imagine the interconnection of all of these ideas with these tori and, and these winding paths. But I will say that if our idea is in the right direction and we start to catalog and understand the group theoretic to graph theoretic relationships via this hot fiber related projective framework and in so doing we will be handed the patterns naturally for, for the fundamental particles and gauge symmetry physics. Note that I said if our path is in the right direction, if we're doing the, the right thing to mess with this E8 to Elser Sloan to QSN object, if that's true, then things will just start presenting themselves. But we have to dive in and start cataloging. Got to start analyzing, cataloging, and then we will recognize fundamental particle group theoretic gauge symmetric physics will just pop out naturally to us. So in summary, I'm suggesting these things. There is a radically new interpretation of the invariance of the speed of light, which leads to space-time as changing 3D you know, on a graph. All actions come from the Elser Sloan quasicrystal relative to the QSN, not necessarily shift vectors on E8. To deeply understand this motivation, you have to understand the idea of how both the QSN and Elser Sloan quasicrystal are ideal possibility spaces for inflation sequences to describe both massive and massless particles, like they're perfect as possibility spaces. Like you can't enrich or improve the QSN. It's this ideal network of Fibonacci chains where when looked at as tetrahedra collapses to the minimum possible plane classes as 10 plane classes. It's just like 
mathematically it's this ideal object that we haven't really proven yet why and exactly how it's ideal. It's just that those of us who've been playing with it for the most years and have collected a lot of facts about it and we suspect that it's, it's ideal. I suspect it may be the irreducibly powerful trivalent graph if you're trying to use trivalent graph theory like Wolfram for modeling non-local, non-deterministic um, quant discretized quantum field theory. Accordingly, I'm saying that the 4D abstract Higgs space that Garrett speaks of is the Elser Sloan quasi-crystal. He likes E8, but the, QS, but the Elser Sloan encodes the gauge symmetry physics of E8. So I, you know, I think anything you can do in E8 with gauge symmetry unification physics, you can do in the Elser Sloan quasi-crystal using, using non-crystallographic folding matrices to relate your equations. Garrett is talking about three-dimensional space that we're familiar with and a four-dimensional space, all orthogonal to that, right. where this is. Now, if you're saying that uh, the ESQC is in that four-dimensional space, right. in his model, that's completely separate from our three-dimensional space. That's right, in ours too. In ours too, it's also completely separate. Yeah. It's like the non-physically real space. It's the abstract, not exactly physical orthogonal space. And down here, as, as sequences of state selections happening at an extraordinarily fast rate, we have the state selections as inflations on the QSN. But the QSN is in the, is, is the QSN in the subspace of the ESQC, or is it in the three-dimensional space that's completely orthogonal to that? Well, it's in the, the QSN is in the, in the Elser Sloan, because if you think of any state of the QSN as some slice of the Elser Sloan relative to where you are, the slicer at some coordinate in Elser Sloan, then that slice represents a sort of version of an inflation on the compound quasi of the QSN and then you just mirror it or clone it, you know, with this five groups rotations to bring it back to H3 symmetry so that you can have the correspondence to the full, you know, the full set of, uh, of uh, complementing slices. So in other words, Fong, Fong takes 20 slices. So you, if she's in, a, imagine Fong as a little Maxwell's demon and she's the cut, she's the cut demon. So she's in Elser Sloan. She picks this one arbitrarily selected tetrahedron and then every other tetrahedron to infinity in that three-dimensional subspace she takes. But she can also take other copies. She can take 19 other copies and then organize them in R3 such that she, develops, she makes it H3 symmetric. Right. And, so and, right? so, so, so if, and then if she does it again, she would have to move to a different coordinate and, and, and start over again. Yeah. Or she can not move and let a shift vector change it. So in other words, she either moves, she either moves in, in Elser Sloan to get a different slice to create changes in QSN, or she stays at the same coordinate in the Elser Sloan quasibility space and she lets Dugan change her space by moving his shift vector in R8 in, 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 the, in the E8 lattice, and then, that ch and then Fong doesn't have to move. So that's why I'm suggesting we don't, we, we don't, it's identical. We don't need to take changes up in E8. We just move Fong. <laughs> we move things. So let's just stick with the moving Fong thing. So we've got the four-dimensional space with the ESQC, and we've got Fong making her selections in there. And in the, so in the subspace of that, we have the QSN, but all of this is associated with a single point in our actual three-dimensional space because it's all orthogonal to, to our three-dimensional space. Right. So what, how do we get from there, get structure in our three-dimensional space? From, from Garrett's point of view, every point in three-dimensional space has this whole associated structure with it. Yeah. Oh, no problem. So what we're going to do is we're going to take Garrett's view and we're going to force Garrett to discretize space and time such that not every point 
can do this. Oh, no, no, that's, that's not right. the issue I was talking about. Okay, but I'm gonna, I was gonna... Even if we discretized our space, it's each discrete point yes. has this whole... Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna get, to, I, I, I interpreted that, but so just establishing that we're gonna not say every point, but we're gonna say down at the Planck uh, scale, you don't have to go more than a Planck length or so before you should get to another coordinate in R3 where there should be able to appear either a photon, positron, you know, a neutrino, etc., fundamental particles at any coordinate. So think about this notion of the underlying possibility space, this foundational, beautiful... Wait, okay. I, yeah, yeah. We're, st we're still getting... I'm getting confused between when you're talking about the R3 where the QSN lives as a subspace in the four-dimensional space of the ESQC versus the R3 of physical space. Okay, but hold on that now and, 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 and follow me a step further. So we're in the QSN, right? Yeah. There's nothing physical happening whatsoever yet because the QSN is not physic. It's not real yet. The only thing that's real is some legal state selection as an inflation upon the QSN. We call that the compound quasi-crystal, the CQC. CQCs are physical QSN is a possibility space. So we're here at this QSN possibility space, non-physically realistic. We're right here. This is Planck volumes now. But this is and not in, this is in the subspace of the ESQC. I, want, I wanted you to leave that alone. I wanted you to leave that until I, like, don't imagine 4D yet. Uh, meaning, don't relate it because your confusion is relating it and I'm, I'm taking you a, a, a circuitous route. So I'm saying you're in, you're in the possibility space and basically, the question is, here in this possibility space around me, let's say it's three by three by three Planck volumes, some real small area of the foundational possibility space. The question is, in this, in this small volume, how many different fundamental particles can exist over some sequence of inflation steps right here? And the question is, we can't answer that until we know what the fundamental uh, quasi-particle patterns are. But let's pretend, let's speculate that fundamental particles are how a 20 group moves around. Some of them move with Hamiltonian circuits that are one way, like on the path of a uh, icosadodecahedron in the QSN. Others might move uh, not on, on uh, Hamiltonian circuits at all. Other patterns may just propagate helically. So, and we imagine that these are these very small set of fundamental particles. And we ask, all right, so what exactly defines how these unknown particles can be? And that's where you get to Elser Sloan. <clears throat> so how, how you move Fong up in Elser Sloan defines what is represented down here. If she moves one way, she's a projection operator, so as she, and she's always going to move in some way relative to these interesting tetrahelical paths that 20 groups, which are always part of 57 groups, can take as they wind around these paths that we don't know all of the details of these paths yet. That's what we have to catalog. And so, that, so that's my attempt to answer your question is how she moves up here in the perpendicular space is defining what fundamental particles and interactions can occur in this three by three by three Planck volume in the possibility space as sequences of inflations. And, and Richard, so to answer your question short, QSN is not a subspace of the S1 quasi crystal. It is a composite of uh, various subspace of the S1 quasi crystal. I can talk with you on more the detail this afternoon, but QSN is not a subspace of those. Uh, topologically, though, we may find out that if Fong can take one slice and then clone it 19 more times and rotate it by the jitterbug rotation, if she can do that, then she, in some sense, can take all 20 slices from Elser Sloan. And the trick is, all right, if she does takes all 20 slices from Elser Sloan, how do you defend the rotation action that she did to composite all 20 uh, in the QSN. And if you can defend that, then you can say yes to your question of whether or not. not then. It's a composite of a different space. Topo really I, uh, I said topologically, though. 
So, so I'm saying, in other words, if you have one, one of the three-dimensional objects is definitely a subspace. Now the question is, I definitely have 20 other sub, 19 other subspaces there. The question is, all right, if each one of those 19 others is also a subspace, then, then when I bring all 20 down here to R3 and I rotate them such that the whole point set cannot be a point set in Elser Sloan. It can't. But topologically, you can map it. Because you can map each one of the... But you can map them does not mean that's a 3D subspace. It's not, but I, I, that's why I'm saying it is not a 3D subspace. I'm saying it topologically, it may be possible to argue why topologically you could map all 20. You know, in her, she compounds it so far, you, you could you map... You can always map them. Yeah. It's a subspace. It's a subspace topologically. Yeah. But I wouldn't call it a three D though. Yeah. It's not. A, it's not a. It's not a subspace. It would, you'd have to say it's topologically. You could map all t all twenty of the slices. All right. So. So I'm saying that the small set of directions relative to this space, that is the Higgs field space, and this symmetric. Uh, polytope, uh, this four-dimensional symmetric polytope, which, which live in this 4D space, the Higgs space, are exactly our projection operators that send different patterns down to the physical space of the QSN inflation selections, the ordered sets of inflations. So his directions between the physical space and the perpendicular space that generate different particles in the physical space are dynamic as ordered sets of projective transformations, inflation operations. And the ordered sets form circuits in the, in the Elser Sloan quasi crystals, such as Seifert paths on 600 cells, which topologically map to things like triangular based trefoil knot toruses in the R three-based quasi-crystal spin network. There will be one circuit on a torus for hadrons and one for electrons and positrons. This is just my speculation, so this is the conclusion. And we're, we will figure out things like neutrinos when they are shown to us by a rigorous cataloging exploration of the natural paths in the Elser-Sloan quasi-crystal.